You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on this first day of November 2013. Welcome to episode 286 of the Corbett Report podcast, Rockefeller Medicine. Quote, The crisis in today's healthcare system is deeply rooted in the interwoven history of modern medicine and corporate capitalism. The major groups and forces that shaped the medical system sowed the seeds of the crisis we now face. The medical profession and other medical interest groups each tried to make medicine serve their own narrow economic and social interests. Foundations and other corporate class institutions insisted that medicine serve the needs of their corporate capitalist society. The dialectic of their common efforts and their clashes, and the economic and political forces set in motion by their actions, shaped the system as it grew. Out of this history emerged a medical system that poorly serves society's health needs. End quote. Well, a timely post there. So what is that taken from? Is that a blog post by an outraged American citizen who is realizing that Obamacare is now raising premiums of the average American out there by as much as 539%? Or is this some sort of uh, snapping point that uh, one of the liberal blogs has reached in realizing that they have been duped and that healthcare uh, Obama style is not manna from heaven in which government somehow magically gives people uh, medicine from on high because they care so much about them, but is in fact a, a fraud from top to bottom that has been designed to further plunder the wealth of the average American. Uh, no, actually, as a matter of fact, this is a, uh, a section, in fact, the introduction to a book that was written in 1979 by E. Richard Brown, published by the University of California Press. That's right. People have been talking for decades and decades and decades now about how America's healthcare system is broken and is certainly not serving the needs of Americans with the highest medical uh, rates, the highest proportion of salaries and the highest proportion of GDP being spent on healthcare in America in the entire world. This is obviously a problem of, well, excuse the pun, epidemic proportions. And the question is, how have we arrived at this spot? Well, there are some obvious answers to this and some not-so-obvious answers. And one of the not-so-obvious answers that is being studiously avoided in the left-right farcical phony debate about Obamacare, which, as always, tries to spin things off into a phony left-right paradigm and a political agenda that doesn't really amount to any difference whatsoever, one thing that is studiously avoided is, well... Speeches like this by Senator Max Baucus, who helped pass the Obamacare Act back in 2009, and who was at that time thanking some of the people who made that act possible. And I want to single out one person. And that one person is sitting next to me. Her name is Liz Fowler. Liz Fowler is a ch our, my chief health counsel. Liz Fowler has put my team together, the health healthcare team. Liz Fowler worked for me many years ago, since left the private sector, and then came back when she realized that, that she could be there in the creation of health care reform, because she wanted to, in a certain sense, that to be her, her professional lifetime goal. She put together that, uh, the white paper last November 2008, 87-page um, document, which became the basis, the foundation, the blueprint from which almost all health care measures and all bills, both sides of the aisle, I came from. She's an amazing person. She's a lawyer. She's a PhD. She's just so decent. She's always smiling. She's always working. So she's always available to help any center, any staff. And I just, I thank Liz at the bottom of my heart. And in many ways, she typifies, she represents um, all the people who've worked so hard to make this bill such a great accomplishment. So what, you're thinking? So who is this Liz Fowler anyway, and why is it so important to be bringing up this, well, gr gushing and rather embarrassing praise from Senator Baucus on the House floor? Well, it's because Liz Fowler is not just someone who was formerly in private industry, as he tangentially ma made mention of in that speech, 
but someone who, well, had a very interesting uh, history, and one that we can even pick up from mainstream sources like NBCNews.com, which had a post back a few years ago, Fact or Fiction? Senate Chairman Has Ties to Big Insurer. Quote, Elizabeth Fowler, now, served, now serving as counsel to Baucus on the Finance Committee, worked as an executive, not a lobbyist, for WellPoint, the largest publicly traded commercial health benefits company from 2006 to 2008. Prior to that, she'd worked for Baucus. Committee spokesman, spokeswoman Erin Shields called Fowler one of the brightest healthcare minds in the Senate, and she and the Finance Committee staff have been working day and night to reach the goal of reform that lowers costs and ensures quality affordable healthcare coverage, which is Baucus's priority. Shields added that the only factor that influences his decisions and the decisions of his staff is whether a policy is right for his state and for the American people. According to Senate records, Michelle Easton, former chief health counsel to the Finance Committee under Baucus, is lobbying for WellPoint for her firm, Tarplin Downs & Young. End quote. Well, of course, that, that um, MSM uh, post obviously downplays the important aspects of this. The fact that Liz Fowler, the person who Baucus was gushing about and who was absolutely essential in bringing the Affordable Care Act to the American public was not just a lobbyist for the world, uh, for America and the world's largest publicly traded health benefits company, but was in fact an executive for them. And if we wanted to be even more specific, which oddly NBCNews.com decided not to be, she was a former vice president of WellPoint. So here we have someone in the very heart of the private insurance world coming in to write the very Affordable Care Act, which is supposed to provide all of this wonderful manna from heaven free health care to the public except for the fact that it's going to cost the average American much, much, much more to get insured under this new regime. Here it is, unmasked for us all to see the point at which uh, the, the media has been studiously avoiding, which is that, yes, this is crony capitalism, a.k.a. fascism, a.k.a. corporatism, to its core. This is it for all the world to see. This is what it looks like, and this is exactly why healthcare costs in the United States are absolutely out of control and only getting worse as the government comes along to fix it and make it better with the help of their friends in WellPoint and other uh, private health insurance companies. Absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that most people in the audience probably don't even know this fact is outrageous considering the amount of coverage that the uh, mainstream media has given Obamacare in recent months and recent years. And by coverage, of course, I mean cover up. Well, we could examine this in more detail today, but I, today I want to look more at the roots of this fascist corporatist system and how it developed, specifically with regards to the healthcare industry, because obviously that is something of pressing importance for Americans and people around the world in this day and age. And it's important to know that this did not come about through happenstance or mere chance. This happened as a result of a concerted and carefully plotted plan that was laid out generations ago by people with with malice aforethought, we'll put it that way. And just for an example of how and when and why and who this plan developed and originated from, we should turn back to that uh, that book that we opened today with, with reading that, that short passage from the introduction. I mentioned it was by E. Richard Brown. It was published by University of California Press in 1979. But I did not mention the title of that, the, that book, which is Rockefeller Medicine Men, Medicine and Capitalism in America. Oh, that's right, folks. The American healthcare system really does go back to the Rockefeller family. As the legislatures under Rockefeller's uh, leadership, he set up the American League of Municipalities, which controlled all the small towns in the United States, and the American Association of State Governments, which controlled all the state governments in the United States, including the legislatures, and they used the state legislatures to draft uh, new methods for controlling uh, doctors and hospitals. And so all hospitals and all doctors had to be licensed through state legislature, which sounded wonderful if you didn't know what was going on. <laughs> that you had to go through John D. Rockefeller to get a medical license and a hospital license. Wow. That's, that's what they're about to. And that's the system we have today. 
and today we've become the sickest nation in the world and the most expensive medical care in the world, except you never get well. <laughs> Which seems to work out for everybody except the patients. Where it's good for the doctors, isn't it? <laughs> good for the doctors. It's Drug good for companies. Oh, yeah. So everybody's happy except the poor patients. <laughs> and whenever you go to a doctor today and he prescribes a medicine for you, he says, you're going to have to take this medication for the rest of your life because it's against AMA principles to ever cure anybody. They've actually uh, brought doctors up on charges of curing people. <laughs> and they've drummed some of them out of the AMA for that very reason, because you're curing people. <laughs> because this might be the right thing to do, but uh, from a business standpoint, it's better to keep them sick and sure. keep them buying the medicine, which they buy from the Rockefeller drug companies and go to the Rockefeller hospitals, and everybody's happy. And now they have the scam where the, if you can't afford it, the government's going to buy the drugs from the Rockefellers and give it to you, right? Well, that's why they had the Medicare system, because they developed Medicare. You know, for, for, I point out in my book, uh, a Murder by Injection, that for many years, the AMA spent millions of dollars in Congress to fight Medicare because it was called government medicine, and they didn't want, the doctors were very independent, and they didn't want the government to control their business. Well, they wound up as uh, employees of the government, and that's what they are. And now this new drug act, they're going to supply the drugs to the people that can't afford it with the taxpayers' money, but the drug companies will still get the, the, the money. They get the money. Yeah. Because a lot of the people are... Uh, are buying drugs today and medications, like elderly people like myself, they couldn't afford the drugs, and so uh, the government would pay for them. <laughs> what a racket. Well, it shows that these people are good businessmen. They're yeah, well, very good, yeah. <laughs> I not, mean, they're not very ethical, though. Uh, well, you and I could never think of <laughs> such a diabolical plan. <laughs> Well, that's right. You and I never could think of such a diabolical plan, but unfortunately that doesn't stop those who can, and we suffer from a lack of imagination on many of these subjects, which makes us perfect victims for those who would so abuse positions of power and influence in order to increase one's own profitability. Well, that, of course, was a brief set snippet of an interview with Eustace Mullins, and of course I'll put the link into the full video uh, interview so you can watch that on YouTube, along with, of course, all of the other things that I mentioned in today's episode in the show notes at CorbettReport.com. But, uh, well, this is a pretty grand claim to be making, that the Rockefellers were absolutely essential in shaping modern American medicine, and uh, this could be cast aside as mere conspiracy theory by those who are not so familiar with the Rockefellers or their influence. And for example, I mean, just as one example of that, we could cast our minds back to The Last Word on Snake Oil, a video that I produced a couple of years ago, showing that the Rockefellers' roots, ironically enough, really does go back to medicine, aka, aka fake medicine, aka snake oil, as uh, the progenitor of the Rockefeller dynasty, John D. Rockefeller's father, was in fact not only a bigamist and a, and a, a shuckster, but in fact uh, also someone who literally sold snake oil, um, a, attempting to cure people's cancer, um, and billing himself as a doctor when he was in fact not a doctor. So the Rockefeller's roots and their, their, their first uh, attempt at amassing a fortune really does go straight back to the idea of, um, well, attempting to cure people's cancer while doing nothing of the sort. That's just an ironic bit of history lesson, and I'll include the link into that uh, video as well, so you can go and watch the last word on snake oil, which I think is still very relevant today. But uh, but again, there may be some who think, oh, Rockefeller, oh, you're just coming up with these crazy conspiracy theories. What do the Rockefellers have to do with medicine anyway? How did working for a Nobel laureate at the Rockefeller University shape your science career? So that was a pretty serendipitous event in my life. I knew I wanted to come back to New York City and I was applying to postdoctoral positions in New York City. And a friend of mine at the time who was in New York City said to me, if you're going to go and do your postdoc there, you should go to the best possible place you can go. And that's the Rockefeller University. And for people who aren't familiar with it, the Rockefeller University is one of the most unique universities you'll ever come across. It doesn't have an undergraduate program, it has a graduate program and an MD-PhD program. It's small, it has no departments, it has no silos, it's unbelievably well funded. It's an amazing intellectual place. And I applied and got an interview in 
this guy Paul Greengard's lab. I was interested in the stuff that he was doing. I went on my interview, gave a presentation, went out to dinner with him, and got got the offer. And five months later, he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And I never could have known that that was going to happen when I accepted my position in the lab. And I always joked with him afterwards that it's good that he, I got in before he won the Nobel Prize, because after he got it, the applications to the lab were skyrocketing. And I always thought I would never get in. And he always said, yes, you would still get in. You would still get in. Um, but that experience showed me the best of science. What's it like to be in one of the most world-renowned, successful laboratories? Um, what's it like to be a scientist in a lab where funding isn't you know, the biggest issue, like it is in most labs? Well, oh, yes. I mean, that Rockefeller family, yes. The Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller University, yes. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, the Rockefeller name is associated with medicine, but but not the family. I mean, they haven't had anything to do with it since the, uh, the founding of the Rockefeller Foundation back in the early 20th century, right? Well, this is, of course, something that is not really controversial for anyone who's actually studied the literature on the subject, uh, which continues to amass a pace. In fact, earlier this year, there was a uh, book r uh, released via the auspices of Guangxi uh, Normal University Press, um, published by a Chinese scholar entitled To Change China, the Rockefeller Foundation's Century-Long Journey in China, which notes that, again, the Rockefeller Foundation was absol absolutely essential in shaping modern Chinese medicine as well as the American medical system. And uh, just reading from a, a short article on this on, on Global Times, it says, quote, the concept of traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, that stood in opposition to Western medicine developed in the late 19th century. Before that, Chinese doctors were open and flexible in their acceptance of Western treatments and ideas, but as Western techniques and theories outstripped Chinese ones and cultural conflicts developed, the idea that traditional Chinese treatments were either outdated or needed to be defended developed, culminating in a division of Chinese medical pra practitioners into Western and Chinese medicine by the 1920s. Uh, in her book, To Change China, The Rockefeller Foundation's Century-Long Journey in China, just published in Chinese, Ma Chu Xia, Associate Professor of East Asian Studies at Oberlin College, holds that NGOs, especially the Rockefeller Foundation, contributed to this process. The basis of Western modern philanthropy that had, had been established, and the West was moving toward modern ideals of evidence-based medicine when the Rockefeller Foundation, endowed by billionaire John D. Rockefeller, entered China in the early 20th century. With the spreading of the missionary movements, Rockefeller became increasingly interested in China. His foundation bought the Union Medical School and renamed it the Peking Union Medical College. The foundation not just wanted to establish a first-class school of medicine in China, it also introduced the U.S. Johns Hopkins medical model to the Peking Union Medical College Hospital and viewed it as a laboratory of their social ideas, which reflects the foundation's ambition to change China." End quote. I'll let you continue reading on on that subject and reading the book if you are so inclined, but that's just one indication of the massive global reach that the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller Foundation had, very much so in the early 20th century, and which continues to shape the, the uh, societal and, and educational and medical and all sorts of other institutional practices and institutions themselves to this very day, as reflected by the previous clip that we just watched. But again, it's not a conspiracy, and it's very much documented history how the Rockefeller Foundation, in cooperation with some of the other corporate foundations that developed via the auspices of the robber barons of the 19th century, had a profound effect on shaping American medical discourse in the late 19th, early 20th century. And again, this has been documented many times, many ways, in many places by many people. So let's take a look at just one example of that that goes towards explaining how how the modern system of allopathic medicine, as opposed to homeopathic medicine, developed as a result of the Rockefellers and their influence. The answer to this question may be found in some historic events that took place almost a century ago, when official medicine finally managed to gain the upper hand on the so-called empirical doctors, who cured patients with herbs and natural remedies. In the 1800s, society sanctioned both approaches to healing. Patients had a choice of using either doctors called allopaths or natural healers called empirics or homeopaths. The two groups waged a bitter philosophical debate. 
the allopathic doctors called their approach heroic medicine. They believed the physician must aggressively drive disease from the body. They based their practice on what they considered scientific theory. The allopaths used three main techniques. They bled the body to drain out the bad humors. They gave huge doses of toxic minerals like mercury and lead to displace the original disease. They also used surgery, but it was a brutal procedure before anesthesia and infection control. Few patients were willing to have surgery. Most patients feared allopathic methods altogether. Satirist of the day remarked that with allopathic treatment, the patient died of the cure. Competing with the doctors were the empiric healers. Contrary to the doctors, they believed in stimulating the body's own defenses to heal itself. Instead of poisonous minerals, they used vegetable products and non-toxic substances in small quantities. They especially favored herbs learned from Native American and old European traditions. The empirics said they based their remedies not on theory, but on observation and experience. Satirists of the day added that with empiric treatment, the patient died of the disease, not the cure. And the balance of medical power remained equal until the turn of the century. Then, new medical treatments emerged that were potentially very profitable. The AMA joined with strong financial forces to transform medicine into an industry. The fortunes of Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller financed surgery, radiation, and synthetic drugs. They were to become the economic foundations of the new medical economy. The takeover of the medical industry was accomplished by the takeover of the medical schools. Well, the people that we're talking about, Rockefeller and Carnegie in particular, came to the picture and said, we will put up money. They offered tremendous amounts of money to the schools that would agree to cooperate with them. The donors said to the schools, we're giving you all this money. Now, would it be too much to ask if we could put some of our people on your board of directors to see that our money is being spent wisely? Almost overnight, all of the major universities received large grants from these sources and also accepted one, two, or three of these people that I mentioned on their board of directors, and the schools literally were taken over by the financial interests that put up the money. Now, what happened as a result of that is that the schools did receive uh, an infusion of money. They were able to build new buildings. They were able to add expensive equipment to their laboratories. They were able to hire top-notch teachers. But at the same time as doing that, they skewed the whole thing in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs. That was the efficiency in philanthropy. The doctors from that point forward in history would be taught pharmaceutical drugs. All of the great teaching institutions in America were captured by the pharmaceutical interests in this fashion. And it's amazing how little money it really took to do it. Surgery became viable with anesthesia and infection control, and doctors advocated expensive radical operations. These in turn produced the need for a large lucrative hospital system. Radium fever swept medicine. The price of radium rose 1,000% almost overnight. Another costly technological industry entered the hospital system. A drug industry grew out of the booming patent medicine business. The doctors changed educational standards and licensing regulations to exclude the empirics. Soon, only AMA-approved doctors could legally practice medicine. In a brief 20 years, the AMA came to dominate medical practice. Organized Medicine launched a media campaign to associate the empirics with quacks. The code word for competition was quackery. So now, the average doctor goes through school, he gets a great education, uh, he has to be really smart to get through it, he learns all about drugs, he doesn't know too much about basic nutrition, I found that the average wife of these physicians knows more about nutrition than he does, but they sure know their drugs. And if you go to your typical doctor today, I don't care what it is, chances are you're going to walk out of there with a prescription. Why? 
because that's what he has been trained to do. We can see from all of this, I think, the bare threads of this argument and how it, the Rockefeller Foundation really was influential in shaping the modern American medical system and what it has become, where the Obamacare uh, actually forces people to buy into the private health insurance industry, which of course only further inflates the rates of health care and makes it even less accessible for people who are struggling to make ends meet as it is, while the very richest of the very top, the not 1%, but the 0.0001%, the Rockefellers and others at the very, very top who own the banks that print the money, uh, continue to expand and expand and expand their wealth, even as the lowest people, the lowest, the people on the lowest rung, economic rung of American society continue to fall ever downwards. Again, this is a ridiculous system that could not have developed in any other way but through the careful machinations of an institution like the Rockefeller Foundation and the people who were steering it at the time, not necessarily the Rockefeller family, so much as people like Frederick Gates, who is an interesting character, who we will have more to say about in future episodes of this podcast. But, uh, but people like that very much helped to shape this idea of philanthropy as a tool for social control. And this is a point that is so fundamental it needs to be made again and again and to point out that when free lunches occur, they are never really free. And this is something we all understand intuitively, and yet that thinking goes out the window for many people when they see a free government program. Oh, the government's going to provide free health care. Well, not really free, but it's, it's basically like they're providing health care to the people because they care so much. Think again. And, uh, well, let's start fleshing this out, and let's start taking a look at the motivations behind a family like the Rockefellers and why they would institute a system like what we have in this day and age. What is it that compels and motivates these people to do what they are doing? The first and basest and most easily understandable um, way that we can parse what is happening is, of course, to look at the profit motive. Because make no mistake about it, there is a profit motive, a very obvious one, for a, a family that made its fortune in the petrochemical industry, in oil specifically, to find other uses for their petrochemicals, including the manufacture of modern medicines, which do rely to a large extent on petrochemicals. Hey, how? Look at that. Suddenly the dominant uh, theme of Western medicine becomes, how can we give people more petrochemical-based medicines, which we can jack up and inflate the price? Uh, this is something that I think should be pretty easy to understand, and the way that this was deliberately engineered into society can again be documented by people like Eustace Mullins, who we were listening to earlier in this podcast, and we'll listen to a clip from a different interview, one that goes back even further, a couple of decades now, to, uh, to talk more about the process by which the Rockefellers did implement this system. And Eustace Mullins is someone who should know, having researched this topic carefully for one of his books, Murder by Injection, the story of the medical conspiracy against America, which does go on to document how the Rockefellers have important uh, board, uh, board members on basically every major pharmaceutical company and, and insurance company in America, at least at the time of the writing of Mullins' work, um, Every single board in included at least two or three Rockefeller company men, um, basically Rockefeller uh, associates who were uh, associated with the Rockefeller Bank or the Rockefeller Foundation or some Rockefeller institution or other. So it should be no surprise there, and it should be no, uh, no great mystery how all of this comes together to create a system that benefits people like the Rockefellers financially. The greatest achievement of the uh, modern drug trust was the invention of the thousand dollar pill. They have uh, now, they'll tell you, they have one pill which costs a thousand dollars, which you use in cancer and various things. And uh, nature, unfortunately, has never learned how to make a thousand dollar pill. So uh, obviously, nature is no good as far as the medical monopoly is concerned. Well, tell us a little bit, just before we get into that also, there's a difference between homeopathic medicine and allopathic, and that's part of what we're discussing also. Tell us a little bit about that, if you would, Eustace Mullins. Well, what you're talking about is a historic situation. In the 19th century, most Americans uh, thrived on what is called homeopathic medicine, which is mostly naturopathic remedies available through nature in abundance at low cost. Well, the medical monopoly, which was formed in 1847 as the American Medical Association, 
they didn't like this. They thought, how are uh, doctors going to get rich and how are we going to control the people through the medical monopoly when they can go to these homeopathic people and get these remedies at very low cost? So the first plank of the AMA was we will never allow any homeopathic physician to become a member of the AMA, and they never have. So, but the AMA was still in a minority. So around the turn of the century, John D. Rockefeller realized there were great potentialities of profit in the medical industry. And so uh, he took over the medical profession. Uh, now you say, how could anybody take over the medical profession? Well, first you have to have a lot of money, and second you have a lot of power. Well, he had both, and he did. So he revamped the entire medical system of treatment of the people of the United States, which had been homeopathic. He switched it over to allopathic medicine, which is a different type of practice originating in Germany. And the great attraction of allopathic medicine is it relies on uh, radical surgery. I mean, if you can't cure it, cut it off. And... Uh, uh, the heavy use of drugs, because when you're having your limbs cut off, you need a lot of drugs because it's uh, very disturbing, and uh, lengthy hospital stays, none of which are features of homeopathic medicine. It's entirely the reverse. So uh, by taking over the medical industry in 1910 uh, through studies which he made through the Carnegie Foundation, John D. Rockefeller emerged as the kingpin of the medical monopoly in the United States. And he now presided over an allopathic system of medicine controlled through every legislature by accreditation of hospitals, uh, uh, control of physicians, control of medications, and which is essentially what we have today. So from 1910, when this change was effected, uh, right to the present day, the cost of health care has multiplied astronomically in the United States to the point where it is no longer uh, available to most American citizens. Uh, so how did they counteract this? When they got us to the point where the average working man could not afford hospital care or the allopathic system of treatment, uh, they set up an insurance industry, medical insurance. And uh, through this, they were able to spread out the costs among everybody. And, and uh, health insurance today is simply another tax on the American people. In fact, it functions through the Social Security system as a tax on the recipients of uh, Social Security. They say, well, now that you've reached uh, your senior citizen's bank, uh, you have uh, Social Security coming in, so then they jerk back a good portion of it for, as Medicare costs, which they raise every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so eventually, uh, probably, uh, Social Security and Medicare will be equal, so you'll get a church uh, check uh, every month which will be zero, zero, zero. They say, well, here's your social security check, but we've deducted your Medicare uh, costs, and so now you get zero. And it's funneled into the Rockefeller-style monopoly, whoever is involved in it. Oh, is all, of the, all of the money from the health industry goes into the medical monopoly and the drug trust. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the Rockefellers control every uh, major drug company in the world, and now when I say control, I mean directly. They have, among the directors and officials of each of the 18 largest drug companies in the world, they have men from Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, from the Exxon uh, Oil Company, and so forth. So they're right there. The names, I have all their names in my book, Murder by Injection. And uh, with this kind of control <clears throat> and the monopoly, they have been jacking up the health costs on the American people monthly, not yearly, but monthly. I think all of this is easy enough to understand and easy enough to follow from A to B to C to see how a Rockefeller family and John D. Rockefeller, with an almost incalculable fortune back at the turn of the century, was able to parlay that fortune into a found tax-exempt foundation, let's not forget, that was able to invest its resources in uh, philanthropic concerns, quote unquote, that even helped to par parlay that fortune even further so that Rockefeller's heirs are even more substantially wealthy. Although not if you read Forbes' wealthiest men in the world list, but 
do you really trust that list? Um, but uh, suffice it to say, I think it is easy enough to understand how the uh, Rockefeller Foundation has been used to further Rockefeller cartel interests. And we've seen that in previous editions of this podcast. For example, The Truth About the Gene Revolution, where we looked at how the Green Revolution and then the Gene Revolution, both Rockefeller-funded and supported endeavors, have gone on to serve Rockefeller cartel interests in uh, the monopolization of the food supply. Well, in the precise same way, we can document and, and look at how the monopolization of healthcare services in the United States has again furthered the Rockefeller cartel interests, this time in the Rockefeller drug empire and the pharmaceutical industry that is related to it. But I think we also have to understand that there is something deeper behind this, an agenda that goes beyond the mere profit motive, because it is something of a truism that once we get into the rarefied part of the, the economic stratosphere, in, that the Rockefellers and Rothschilds and the other 0.0001% of the elite reside in, where they not only have access to unlimited amounts of wealth, but access to the processes by which that wealth is created and or destroyed, i.e. the banks themselves that create create the money out of thin air, I think we understand that profit isn't in and of itself a motivating driving factor for the David Rockefellers and others of the world. There has to be something more fundamental at base. And as I've made the point many, many times on this podcast and in the interviews that I do, I think that the, at the end of the day, this is not about money. This is about power. And money can be parlayed and, and used as a type of currency to buy and purchase power, but ultimately it is the power itself that is the important factor in this equation. And this power is being wielded for a specific purpose. The driving, motivating ideology of these cartel families, and one that has motivated them demonstrably for generations, which is to say eugenics and depopulation. In 1952, John D. III founded the Population Council, an organization dedicated to promoting the now-debunked fear that overpopulation would ravage the Earth and cause mass death by the year 2000. Rockefeller appointed Frederick Osborne, the leader of the American Eugenics Society, as its first president. In the 60s, the Rockefellers funded a WHO-administered task force on vaccines for fertility regulation that developed anti-fertility vaccines, a task force that eventually succeeded in developing an anti-HCG vaccine that caused spontaneous abortions in vaccinated women. In the 90s, WHO administered tetanus vaccine programs in multiple countries were racked with scandal when it was discovered that vaccines were laced with HCG and causing spontaneous abortions in the third world populations who were being unknowingly injected with them. David Rockefeller continues to promulgate the same overpopulation fear-mongering, always framing the problem so as to posit the United Nations as the only solution, without noting that the UN was built on land donated by his family on the ashes of the League of Nations, an organization founded by Rockefellers and their family allies. Last year, David Rockefeller hosted a meeting of billionaires including Ted Turner, George Soros, Bill Gates, and others, at which they concluded that overpopulation was the world's most pressing problem. The Rockefeller Foundation gives grants to Planned Parenthood, the Population Council, and others. You can see here in 1997, they did a study actually giving fertility control agents to people in, in, in India. Here is the research grant in action. And if you remember just a minute ago, I talked about the Population co Council. These people are getting money from the Rockefeller Foundation. They said mass use of fertility control agent by government to regulate births at an acceptable level. This is actually here, once again, public information by the Population Council from 1969. The overall Rockefeller goal? Well, they say in part, quote, science would eventually come to control the fundamental processes of biology. They literally want to control the entire cycle of life from birth to death everything in between they want to control hormones they want to control glands they want to control genes they have no limit to what they attempt to accomplish and all their funding towards genetic research and more has been part of this goal it was part of their ultimate means of social control and social engineering eugenics Ironically, however, the very innovations that are making possible dramatic improvements in human well-being are also creating new problems which raise the specter of an alarming and possibly catastrophic disaster 
to the biosphere we live in. And herein lies the dilemma that we all face. Let me illustrate. Improved public health has caused the world's infant mortality rate to decline by 60% over the last 40 years. In the same period, the world's average life expectancy has increased from 46 years in 1950s to 63 years today. This is a development which as individuals, we can only applaud. However, the result of these positive measures is a world population that has risen during the same short period of time geometrically to almost six billion people and could easily exceed six billion, eight billion by the year 2020. The negative impact of population growth on all of our planetary ecosystems is becoming appallingly evident. There is a guiding, motivating, driving ideology behind these 0.0001% economic elites, the powers that shouldn't be. It is the desire to get rid of you and me and the people around us from the gene pool so that they and their progeny can survive into the future. Well, that is a pretty dark note on which to leave things, but unfortunately this is the real underlying reality behind the modern American healthcare system and the problems that we see developing out of it. And it's not problems that are going to be fixed by some manna from heaven, affordable care act, or anything that is launched or initiated or spearheaded by the bought and paid for executive branch or the bought and paid for legislature or upheld in the Supreme Court by the bought, bought and paid for judicial branch of the U.S. government. Once again, the answer is not going to come from the U.S. government or its bought and paid for corporate cronies, because this is, of course, the system that has been engineered carefully over the course of generations and shaped by the Rockefeller Foundation and other very special interests who literally control the access to resources on the planet. This is a point that we've talked about in previous episodes. We will continue to elaborate in future episodes, and we will continue to talk about healthcare and the ways that modern Western medicine is not 100% evil. That would be cartoonish and too simplistic. It does certainly provide some benefits, but it is the poison pills that they are able to insert, sometimes literally poison pills, that they are able to insert into that mix, which is the insidious part of all of this. And... I think there's a lot more to be said about eugenics and depopulation and how this figures into it, but as I say, we will leave that for further explorations in further episodes of today's uh, of this podcast. But today I'm going to leave all of you out there with the dual task this week, not only of continuing this research for yourself, as always, and informing me of what you find through the contact form at CorbettReport.com, but perhaps more importantly, spreading the information we've looked at today to others as they, as the Obamacare uh, fiasco makes this a talking point in, uh, in American society at any rate at the moment. This is a prime opportunity to inform others about the real roots of the modern American healthcare system and how we arrived at this spot in the first place. It is not just happenstance. It's not just one of those things you shrug your shoulders and say, well, I wonder how America became the most expensive healthcare system in the world. It has been engineered that way carefully through through methodical planning over the course of generations by people with almost unthinkable amounts of wealth and access to resources to make that happen. So I will uh, once again leave you today with that humble task of attempting to spread this to others and inserting some truth into the conversations that are happening right now about Obamacare. And on that note, I am thanking you once again for joining me for this edition of the podcast and asking you to join me again next week for another edition. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.